guys, welcome to another episode of Emancipated Human. I'm your host, Luis. I first want to apologize for a couple of week uh, parentheses there that we didn't have a show. I, I was actually doing a lot of uh, other work. Um, so today I have Corey Watkins. Uh, for some reason I can only pronounce his last name with British accent, but that's kind of awesome too. I'm in his house and he's done a lot of cool work, as you know by now. I really like to bring uh, powerful and practical examples of people that are doing a lot of work with liberty and this guy has done so much so much work in that regard so first of all i want to thank you for allowing me to be here in your house today yep. it's uh got my dog here yeah <laughs> hey, cash it's actually um, her mother's house yeah well, so we're here and we're actually doing some um homeschooling and he's, he's yeah. doing a lot of work so first of all you sit who down. is uh you can come you can sit on his lap that's fine who you is Corey Watkins. Uh, well, I'm just a. Uh, I'm a father. I'm a. Uh, I'm a sports lover, and uh, most of all, you know, um, I understand the, the situation we have here in our country, and and I want some of some of what we've lost back, you know, liberty and freedom. So um, that's that's kind of the journey I've been on lately. Yeah, thank you. I, I you know, a lot of times, like I was telling you earlier, um, <clears throat> there's a difference between just theorizing about it. And it's nice to know all about, you know, all the books and all that jazz, but the actual work, you know, it's about human action, what we do, and you've been doing a lot of uh, powerful work. Um, what inspires you to do such thing? Well, you know, uh, I have two children, and I know they're going to be here after, after I am, and I just want to make sure there's, uh, there's more things that they can do. Um, that I wasn't able to do, um, you know, that our founders intended that have been taken from us. I, I want some liberty and freedom. I want some more for them. I, um, you know, I never really knew what liberty and freedom really m meant, the true meaning of it. You know, a lot of people talk about it. A lot of people sing like the national anthem and the pledge and they feel all patriotic and stuff. But like, what does liberty and freedom really mean? And, uh, you know, I started doing some research, looking into some things, and um, I ran across uh, Ron Paul, and he's kind of opened up my eyes to, you know, what our founding fathers really intended. You're so goofy. That's wonderful. I, <clears throat> in that regard, I was awakened also by Ron Paul. I think he has done a lot of um, all the leg work and, you know, within the belly of the beast. So um, he, I, kudos to him uh, if he ever watches this. Um, uh, we can go into the media stuff like what are you doing these days like you homeschool you have two children what else do you do you garden you i've, I've noticed you do grow some food right yeah yeah we do some uh, uh gardening we uh, uh homeschool i love doing the homeschool um i'm just lucky my schedule allows it you know um i, I work bartender at night here at a local restaurant that way um you know during the day i have some time with my children and stuff and we love doing that we've got a little uh garden it's really for the community um we cleaned up a bunch of trash that was in an area and uh, we turned it into like a little mini garden so that was kind of cool and, and don't forget the sticks sticks <laughs> we put out oh yeah all the, the the sticks and trash that we moved out into the dumpster so that was pretty cool but uh yeah you know anything that we can do to uh you know go back to you know independent um you know self-independence, uh, self-reliance, and liberty and freedom, I'm all for it. That's wonderful, and recently you received an award. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. You went to Austin a couple weeks ago? Yeah, it was a couple weeks ago. Can you just sit down? <laughs> went to Austin a couple weeks ago, and uh, there was uh, Texas Texans for Accountable Government uh, uh, down there uh, in Austin. They have a, a wonderful group. And there was their sixth anniversary, and every year they give away a uh, award for activist of the year. And I was nominated, and I won, so that was awesome. I went down there and accepted that. And um, it's just, uh, you know, it's nothing that I I want or was looking for. It's just somebody, uh, a group of people, said that you know I was doing something good, and they um, acknowledged it. So I thought that was awesome. I was, it was a good time too. That's fabulous, and you know your uh, activism <coughs> spreads in several arenas. One of them is uh, Cop Watch. Mm -hmm. The other one is Open Carry, and you're also doing um, 
What else did you start doing recently? I uh, ran for uh, precinct chair That's right. in the Republican Party. Um, <clears throat> and when I first heard about precinct chair, because I just wanted to install myself somewhere local and uh, entry-level position into local politics or whatever the case may be. So uh, I heard about precinct chair and um, ended up running uh, first time around, not really understanding what's going on too much. And uh, I lost by 18 votes. Mm, and, uh, that's pretty close. Yeah, the more I found out who I was running against, it was kind of interesting because it was like, she was like as far as anti-liberty as you can get. And of course me, you know, I'm, you know, as far as to liberty as you can probably get. And so the, it was just too, the inter it was an interesting race. Um, and this time around, uh, she, I actually beat her um, quite well. I got 60% of the vote. Don't touch the camera, buddy. I'm actually kind of surprised that you're with the Republican Party and not with the Libertarian yeah. Party. What happened there? Well, I think I've just kind of learned, um, you know, what Ron Paul was doing. Um, his message to me, in a way, um, you know, he, he did a lot of things with the Libertarian Party, but never really got far uh, with doing stuff for the Republican Party. And I never heard his voice until he was a Republican. And uh, so I, I think... That's one of the reasons, but I, I believe that he was a Republican because some of the ideas that uh, come from the Republican Party um, are libertarianism ideas. Yeah. Um, but they've just been infiltrated, and uh, big government, you know, has has definitely come in, in the way. So, um, I, you know, uh, it, it's just what I felt Ron Paul was doing. I, I needed to do as well. That's that's a good point. That's actually a really interesting point that you're making. Um, also, a precinct chair, but with the Libertarian Party and a and a delegate. So, um, I, I exactly know what you're you're telling me. One other thing, like the exciting stuff now. You and your wife got thrown into jail and beat up, and <laughs> all. You know, I mean, these thugs, these criminals with shiny badges, just like you know, had a day with you guys. Can you like tell yeah. us a story about that one? Um, yeah, we were cop watching like like always, and we I like to stay on the sidewalk because the sidewalk's kind of like the safe haven. It's public property, you know, and and um, at this point, you know, I'm I, I'm doing freedom of press. That's basically what I'm doing. Um, First Amendment, freedom of press, freedom of speech, and we're just trying to create a uh, good line of transparency for. Um, you know, public, ourselves, everybody to see, and we also want to make sure that the police are, are held accountable and doing their duty. So I was staying on the sidewalk the whole time, and uh, we were going out towards Cooper, which is a six six lanes, uh, three going one, then three going the other. And so it's a pretty busy road. We want to make sure we're all safe and staying on the sidewalk. We always wear our safety jackets, the uh, reflector vests. That way uh, police officers can see us, uh, you know, just citizens walking down the street, riding a bike, in their car, whatever the case may be, we want to make sure that we're standing out so everybody can see us. Um, we're not trying to be sneaky or anything like that. So we're walking down on the sidewalk, and we turn this corner, and the officer tells us not to come any farther. But the, uh, the, the traffic stop is probably, at this time, about 70 feet away from us. So that's just ridiculous, you know, for a normal traffic stop. They're trying to be bullies and see how far they can push us back and control us. And... That's not right. That's not right at all. And um, I want to go forward on the sidewalk. And I want to be able to, um, you know, record the, the traffic stop. So we start going forward, and uh, he tells me to stop again. So we stop there for a minute and talk. And at this point, I'm on the edge of the sidewalk. Uh, and I say that because you, where, you know, cars can come in and out, it cuts off the sidewalk. But technically, that's still sidewalk. You know, that's public sidewalk. So I'm standing on the edge of the curb. And uh, he tells me to go back the other way. And at that time, I'm, I'm complying with orders because he seems like he's kind of getting agitated. So I want to diffuse the situation a little bit and give him a little bit uh, of what he wants. And maybe I can't talk to him and get a little bit what I want and move back to the curb or something. I just, I'm not trying to go to jail, that's for sure. So I start walking back the other way and uh, a car comes from uh, behind us into the, into the drive-through where we're walking. And he uh, does his little whoops and his siren like that. And uh, I stepped out of the way for safety, of course. And he kept coming. And it was real quick, like, back 
and uh, he almost hit me uh, and then my wife as well and that's when I stepped forward to kind of protect her I think it was more of a uh, just a natural reaction you know that somebody has like something's about to hit somebody I love and I want to protect it so that's what I did and then I got emotional when I yelled uh, and you know I was quiet the whole night you can hear my but uh, all my recordings I'm cool calm and collective uh, of course there was only one one or two traffic stops before that that were real quick but you know um, I'm not an aggressive person as far as yelling and stuff like that uh, but when something like that happens I just get emotional quickly and and uh, reacted so and they're about to hurt your wife yeah, I yeah. Mean, that's like no laughing matter it's yeah that, no. you take that stuff serious yeah and I did and um, and so I, I don't know why the officer actually arrested me um, I wasn't doing anything illegal I definitely wasn't obstructing a highway um, I was on the sidewalk I was in a safety vest and I was following orders of an officer I was put in that situation if anything I was put in that predicament so uh, but yeah, that's kind of the gist of what happened. I went to jail, spent four hours in there. But before this, like they roughed you up a bit. Yeah, the uh, two nights prior to this, this was kind of events leading up to this. Two nights prior, I uh, was on Cooper Street, same area. We always do Cooper Street because these guys are up and down Cooper Street. It's like a money making machine over there. But uh, we were in that area again. And I was, well, first of all, I had my black powder revolver on me, uh, unloaded. It's just there for demonstration purposes. And, uh, you know, one of the officers right away is really nervous. And, you know, these guys all know who I am. They all know who I am. The police department has, uh, you know, been uh, knowing us for a while because of the open carry. The, and it's not like that I should be a threat to them. I'm not, you know. The first time around, we didn't do anything wrong. You know, they were had like 20 officers up at city council for, you know, the meetings that we were trying to go to as far as them not allowing us to hand out the Constitution. And uh, it's not like we went up there and bombarded their place and we were a bunch of bullies and stuff. You know, we went up there and talked to them and, uh, and tried to reason with them, and they wouldn't do it. So what happened? No, we didn't go up there with guns and start taking the place over. We took them to court. We, we used the system that we have in place, and we beat them. So, you know, they all know who we are. The officer seemed nervous. He told me not to reach for my holster. And I was like, sir, I don't know why you would think I would do that. I'm, I'm, I mean, no threat. And there's a like a 10 minute video of me continuously telling, sir, I'm no threat to you. I'm just recording. I'm just recording. I'm no threat to you. And uh, in that same video, you can see two people on a bicycle and two people on foot walk uh, down a sidewalk, uh, a path that is behind the police officer's cars um, that is actually behind another police officer's car that's pulling over the car so it's actually a good distance behind the original pulled over car and so those people walk down it and then there's this other girl who comes later and I'm standing on the sidewalk with Jacob Dova and we're looking across and the officer goes hey why don't you guys move and let that woman through and I'll turn around I was like oh I didn't know she was behind us go ahead so they basically yelled at us to let a girl go through and so I, I've just seen five people walk the same path. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to walk that same path. And then here goes Corey Watkins. And, like, I go down there, and they just grab me right away. Wow. And, yeah, so I'm like, okay, what's going on here? And they're like, you're a threat to us. You have a black powder, and you're coming in to our black area. Black powder threat. And so, you know, it's, uh, you know, and he asked me, well, why do you bring a gun to a police traffic stop? And so I asked him the same thing. Well, why do you bring a gun to a police traffic stop? You know, and uh, we went back and forth for a minute, and I just told him, you know, hey, I, I have a responsibility and a duty to protect myself, you know, and then he was finally like, well, you're right. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of good, but um, they detained me for 10 minutes and uh, disarmed me uh, and basically violated my first, second, and fourth amendment within a matter of, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. It was disgusting. And uh, a lot of people would look at that video and wouldn't realize that all those things were violated they would just be like oh well, you shouldn't be doing that and it's just you know you're just like come on man it just like, goes where, over their heads yeah, where, how, what, why have we come so far that we haven't realized that is a terrible thing yeah i don't know 
so. we posted this video also on uh, Emancipated Human and the thread was just interesting like a bunch of support from people yeah. but there was that one or two individuals that were just kind of like that's something silly yeah I mean what they, I, I think they just don't understand that sit down please it's okay you can just come here yeah. so now the other thing that you're doing that's pretty I mean okay you got thrown into jail and then you had to be bailed out you, I mean how, how was that well it was um, never good to go to, um, you know, get kidnapped and go to jail, that's for sure. So um, the good thing is, is I had a, a buddy with me, Joseph Ty, he's part of uh, Texas Cop Block, and, you know, so we were hanging together. But, um, you know, w with the support that we have, uh, it's not just citizens. We have uh, legislators, uh, we have lawyers. <laughs> so uh, I knew I was in good hands going in, but... I didn't know if they wanted to mess around with us and keep us in there and kind of long, you know, make it longer stay than than it, than it should be. But when I uh, got my first phone call, which was probably I don't know, 35 minutes after we, after we got there, maybe 40 minutes, it takes a little bit to check in and stuff. Uh, I, I called Jacob because he was on the scene, he was there, and I wanted to know what they had planned um, to do afterwards to try to get me out. I wanted to make sure. My lawyer was contacted and everything, and so um, I called Jacob, and he said everything's good to go. Uh, Jeremy, one of our good friends, Jeremy Blosser, he's a really good um, activist as far as within the party and very smart, intelligent guy who's who understands what's going on. So it's always good to have him on our side, and he's good friends with my lawyer as well. So I wanted to make sure he knew about it and because uh, he had to go bail somebody out in Houston for uh, refusing to ID on some stupid thing that happened down in Houston. So he drove all the way down there one night and bailed some friends out, some activists down there, so that was good. Um, but anyways, I called him second to make double check to make sure everything was good. And then I called, uh, well, he told me not to call my lawyer. He said, because he had already contacted him and they were already working on the papers. And I was like, well, that was pretty fast. And I hadn't even been in here that long. So before I even got to my phone or the my phone call, everything was in action. And, and that it's just good to have people who who act right away so there was no time wasting um, even when I went back and watched one of the videos uh, you know after right after we got into the car uh, everybody's already t already you know trying to plan and discuss what's next you know okay what are we gonna do who do we contact with let's, let's get together and, and think of something so that was good and then uh, shoot we went <laughs> it's funny we went down to the very 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 far left last cell and uh, it was kind of like dim and dark. I don't know if they were going to beat us up or what. It was kind of interesting. Yeah, okay. But uh, it was kind of interesting. We got to stay in there. Um, I was in there for four hours and then ended up ended up getting uh, bailed out. So that was it was refreshing. It was only four hours. So but, Yeah, you know. but still four hours, you know. I mean, these guys are just tax farmers. That's all they do. They, you know, the whole deal of just being a speed traps and you know all around Cooper and basically all Arlington now these guys are thugs like I saw that I think it was Fort Worth Police Department they were like pretty ashamed of what Arlington Police Department yes. were doing and they were like just you know be respectful these guys are just yeah. cop watching I mean what what did you see there well from what I understand um, we have a open carry member who is the son of a Fort Worth police officer or maybe it's his uncle, one or the other, really close relative, whatever the case may be. I think it's his father. But anyways, he had messaged me and uh, he had let me know that Fort Worth police had a uh, you know meeting, like in their briefing, they just said, hey, you know, this cop watch group's getting large and lots of support, and you know we might see some more cop watchers in the area. If you see anybody rec uh, recording a film stop, just smile, wave, be respectful. Um, we don't want to violate their rights, and that, that's the way it should be, you know. Um, I think uh, Fort Worth has always been pretty good about the open carry as well, and. You know, I, I have a couple contacts within the Fort Worth Police Department that have told me, hey, if one of my police officers ever gives you a problem, call me immediately. And I actually had to use that once, and he wasn't lying. He showed up 10 minutes later, and, and, and he was there for us and because you know, I was carrying my black powder at the, uh, at the rodeo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of all places, I was carrying my black powder revolver at the rodeo. Wow. Um, so with the black powder thing, there's a lot of people that don't quite understand the law, just like this police officer this tax farmer. 
I think that's important that maybe you can illustrate that a little bit for us. What's the deal with the black powder and why it's like, I mean, what's the difference between that and, you know, my semi-auto that I carry? When it boils down to it, uh, there's a good amount of difference, uh, but they still both do the same thing. They can take somebody out. They, it's, it's a deadly weapon. It's definitely lethal. Um, but the difference is, one of the big ones, is the law. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we can open carry these. There's no law, rule, or regulation. Um, the only thing you have to do is be 18 years old or older. So it's like buying cigarettes. You walk in, you just show your ID that you're 18 years of older, and that's it. And uh, even a felon can own one of these and open carry them. So. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's so we on our open carry walks all the time. We, you know, we hear people say, "Oh, well, I'm a felon. I can't. You know, I, I don't have the right to protect myself." And I'm thinking, "Damn, that's wrong." You know, oh, here, you know, I, you know, and I, I'm not trying to judge a person. Maybe he um, made a mistake in his life or something. Maybe it's a, you know, non-violent, victimless crime. You know, like the drug war has taken so many people. You know, and, and made their lives so miserable. You know, this guy can't vote, he can't protect himself, and so, you know, I want to educate them, just let them know, hey, you do have an option, there is a call, you know, a black powder revolver. So, it, it's unregulated as far as, like, how you wear it and, and stuff like that. Uh, you know, it's the cap and ball, and how you load it, obviously, is way different than, like, a 9 millimeter or a 40 cal or something like that. Um, and, uh... It's, you know, uh, the, the difference is obviously cap and ball and rim fire and, st and, and you know, it's 1899 or, or prior that you can have one of these. It's a, called pre-1899 black powder revolver or, or replica of it. And um, I have a replica of a 1851 Navy police gun. Actually, actually Arlington police have it right now, <laughs> but I'm supposed to get it back. Uh, but, and, and I've never loaded it. Um, it can be loaded. It can be deadly. But I just use it for educa educational purposes. And and you know I'm, I'm I have I'm armed other ways. You know I so. But but if I, if I have that open, it's a crime deterrent. Just being there. You know um, a criminal doesn't know if that's loaded or not, and they probably don't want to find out. So uh, it, it deters crime with just merely looking at it, you know? So that, that's how powerful some, something like that is. And we don't have that here in Texas besides walking around with a long gun, which is, you know, shotgun, rifle, um, something like that. I prefer my AK-47, um, but I, I would rather have my Glock 19, and that's what we're trying to get at here, you know? Here in Texas, you can walk around with an AK-47 with 100 rounds loaded, chambered, and ready to go. But you can't. You can't with a, a Glock 19 or a Springfield 1911. You know, you, with your modern-day pistols, you're a felon. And, uh, uh, man, I mean, is that what our founders intended? You know, the right to keep and bear arms, ask your government for permission, pay a tax, get your fingers printed, wear it this way. Get, I mean, this. It's all messed up here in Texas right now. So that takes us to the next thing, which is the uh, open carry movement that you're in. Now, the education that you're creating is also gaining a lot of momentum. I've been to a couple of those, and you know, even the idea that women would not join you. You know, I took a picture and posted it on Facebook. There were like 30 women yeah. with their you know rifles, and like the support is pretty impressive. Yeah. When did you start that? Well, the, you know, I definitely wasn't the first person by any means. Uh, uh, after legislation uh, went around and HB 700, which was an open carry bill that was supposed to have pass, it had a lot of uh, momentum. And after that failed, uh, there was a couple random people who went out and did open carry walks. And I think it was more or less empty holster walks. They went around and did empty holster walks. And I think some people did black powder uh, back then as well, just a couple people. Not a lot of people knew about the law back then until uh, a couple other people educated, like, hey, you can walk around with the black powder. But, um, you know, I, I heard about the open carry walks after that, uh, randomly popped up, some in Fort Worth and stuff, and then a, uh, a buddy of mine down in Temple, CJ Grisham, got unlawfully arrested uh, and, you know, handled pretty unruffly uh, and unlawfully 
and he got thrown in jail and he was on a hiking trip with his son uh, in, in the rural area and he was open carrying his AR-15 and you know it was an evil gun and the police officer didn't like it and took him to jail but anyways that set off a, a couple of open carry walks uh, and I joined one of them I think it was either the second or third open carry walk they had it was in the stockyards and that kind of inspired me to do something here in Tarrant County so me and some friends got together and we started planning and said hey let's get some open carry walks going and and see what we can do with this and for whatever reason there's a lot of activists in our area we have a lot of people who are very active uh, whether it be with uh, cop watch whether it be with uh, the Republican Party, Open Carry, Normal. Normal has a great uh, group of people up here. And so, uh, I don't know, it's just an awesome area to be in. I, I once thought about moving out of this area, but I realized how lucky we are as far as the activists we have, so I wanted to stay. But, you know, the uh, it, we, we shortly got together after that and just started putting together consecutive Open Carry walks after Open Carry walks, and bar none, we were the we we still are the most active open carry group you know we, we started doing it two or three times a week at one point you know we had 60 70 people showing up on walks we had uh, one time we put together a walk in North Richland Hills where we gave uh, away two black powder revolvers and we had 160 people show up and that was that was real awesome I mean we had all four corners just swamped with people with rifles and shotguns and signs it was like a never-ending honk you could just the whole it was like for four hours it was just non-stop it was great so uh, you know what you, what you see on the news and the media and stuff uh, the mainstream is a little bit different but when you come out and you see what's happening it's kind of like oh damn they have a lot of support <laughs> so it's it's kind of cool to see it all happen um, you know I didn't really expect all this but it just feels like the right thing to do so I keep doing it you know yeah, so. and that's pretty um, important that I think that there's a lot of people that say, well, I don't have a lot of power, I don't have a lot of uh, things that I could do. I mean, what could you, how could you tell people like that, you know, I mean, because you just like saw something and then did something. I mean, I don't mean to sound like Napolitano here, but right. that's kind of what you guys did, right? Yeah, in a sense, you know, um, we saw something wrong and uh, we knew it was wrong and we have knowledge of it. And so. That we, obviously we're obligated to do something or we're just selfish and I don't want to be that so you know I'm definitely nobody special by by far I'm nobody special I'm just one individual and um, anybody can step up and do something you know I've proven that many other people have proven that um, within our group and it's not me just doing it uh, I don't know why people you know think like I'm the leader or anything like that because I'm not I you know I don't give commands and I'm not king, you know, or anything. We all make decisions together. It's a group effort. So um, for whatever reason, I have to be the face of it. And uh, and sometimes that's not a good thing. A lot of people point me out and, you know, uh, <laughs> say things about me and my family and stuff like that. But, you know, I just, I know that's coming. So you just got to, you know, dust it off and keep moving forward. So, but, um, it, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting thing you know anybody can get up and do it. it it just takes a little bit of motivation and determination one of the most frustrating frustrating things is hearing people say well we can't do anything about it you know mm -hmm. um, and and that's what they want you to think they want you to think you can't do anything about it and um, that's what keeps people um, in their slavery totally. <laughs> thinking they can't do anything about it so um, I'm definitely going to try to test, uh, you know, what we can do as far as use the system and do things peacefully and get get things done. So that's that's what I'm trying to do. Completely. And, you know, the work has been paying off because, you know, there's several establishments that you've gone to that have, you know, you have their complete support. You know, Kroger is one of them, yeah. Target. And, yeah. like, tell us a little bit about that. Well, a lot of people might think that, you know, Target or uh, you know Chipotle these places have actually banned guns but I've gone back in plenty times and nobody said anything and um, basically they're just appealing to the people who don't want us in there and saying hey well we're gonna we're gonna tell them we don't 
we, we recommend them not to bring them in anymore. And there's a huge difference between recommending somebody not to do something and telling them they can't. And so that's the difference. Nobody's telling us we can't. They're just appealing to the others to say, hey, we wouldn't recommend it. But if they want to, they still can. So, And they don't say that, obviously, but if you're smart enough, you can figure that out. It's okay. So I go back into Target all the time. I go back into Chipotle all the time. Managers are real nice. Employees are awesome. And uh, Kroger's been great. You know, I, the picture you see with me and, and my AK-47 in Kroger is actually, um, I think, about a year old. We can't do that anymore because TBAC has stepped up and said we're not allowed to bring rifles and shotguns, openly carrying them into places and establishments that sell alcohol that are TBAC licensed. So, um, you know, that's unfortunate, uh, but hopefully in legislation we can fix that. And uh, it's not an issue of we would get in trouble. It would be the business, and we don't want to do that to the business. It's not right. And it's unfair to the business, too, because, you know, some people won't, won't go to there and shop because they can't bring in their shotgun or rifle. I know that sounds weird, but people shop with their rifles and shotguns now. It's like kind of the, you know, people do it, so. But th another thing that is a um, good thing to know is there's a lot of people trying to push for, you know, legislation to take the guns away, and that just is going to work as well as you know, the war on drugs. Like, people are not doing drugs at all because yeah. of the, you know, hard work of our lovely government, right? Right, yeah. So what that's going to create is, like, only the bad guys are going to have the guns. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, uh, that, that's just what happens in every country that they do that. Like, I mean, Chicago, right? That would be the safest place on Earth. Yeah. You know, I think they said something like uh, there was more deaths in, Af or in Chicago than there was Afghanistan in 2012 or 13, something like that, uh, you know, by gun and stuff. And, and they have, you know, if you're anti-gun, that would be your place to go. But it just seems like there's more, you know, deaths and stuff. Obviously, it's the stats, the facts, the, the history behind, uh, you know, all this. It, it proves where... You know, where you disarm your citizens, you are going to have criminals um, understand that there's people who you can prey on easier, and then government knows that their citizens are weak as well, and it just doesn't work like that. You know, our, our founders had something very smart uh, when they established the Second Amendment, saying, you know, uh, we have the right to keep and bear arms. It shall not be infringed. That means any rule, any regulation in the smallest amount is an infringement you know um, I'd hate to say it but even a criminal who beats his wife uh, it says shall not be infringed and you know the only you know if he wants to have a gun I'm sorry he's gonna go get a gun anyway that's not gonna stop him a, a law is not gonna stop him the only thing it's gonna stop is the law abiding citizen and therefore you're given um, you know uh, you're stopping me from protecting myself why this guy who beats him, uh, who beats his wife senseless is going to go get a gun and, and you know protect himself anyways because he's he doesn't follow the law he's not moral morally right you know and so um, I should always have a right to defend myself so so should everybody else um, and, and that's just the way it should be because it just doesn't work prohibition don't work it doesn't but you're getting into another realm, you know, the moral realm, like legislating on morality and then just like the appeal of emotion of the people that want to ban guns. I don't want to label and say these specific people because there's, you know, I don't want to create that. I mean, everybody knows it, but I think that the people are doing this are working just through the feels, you know, like, oh, I feel this or whatever. I mean, like reality is an armed society is a peaceful society mm -hmm. like you said I mean nobody's gonna want to mug you if you have your weapon there and if somebody wants to mug you regardless they're gonna do it yeah so I mean there's more nice people out there than not and mm -hmm. that's what the media is trying to play with you know there's a ton like outside once you get out of your house that's evil world right but it's not yeah no we've uh, we've walked all over the state of Texas uh, open carrying our guns and uh, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. I must have been on like 200 and something walks. Nobody's ever gotten mugged, gotten shot, not even in the vicinity of the area, no crimes. I mean, one time we were walking in Dallas and uh, police officers told us that we needed to come back every day around like four <laughs> and uh, five because I guess that's kind of when the drug deals and stuff happen or whatever. And we went down there around that time 
and uh, they just scattered like roaches. They said, and you know, we were open carrying our guns, and people were like, you know, oh, stuff. You know, it, it was just, it was, it was interesting how the police had supported us in our cause, and it was like we were a free market security in our own because we were all all open carrying, law abiding citizens. That's how it's supposed to be. We're all supposed to be. Um, policing ourselves and individuals and have that responsibility to say, you know, hey, there's 50 people standing here with guns. I'm pretty sure this one guy here with a gun is not going to do anything to any, you know. I mean, we're all law-abiding. He's not going to go steal something or he's going to be in trouble. It's just, it's like we're all police officers within ourselves, but not really police officers to an extent. You know, I don't want to make say I'm a police officer, but we all regulate ourselves. Exactly. I mean, like the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is with a good guy with a yeah. gun. Yeah. If we take the guns away from the good guys, then we're pretty screwed. Yeah, definitely. We were definitely screwed. And, um, I, I, you know, a lot of people, you know, when I, when I go out, they talk about hunting, like as if it has anything to do with the Second Amendment, and it clearly doesn't. And then a lot of people talk about, well, I support the Second Amendment. I got my CHL, and I'm just thinking, oh, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I get, that, I get that a lot, and it's just frustrating. But I, I, you know, I try to teach them, I try to educate them. But, but you don't need that, you know. The Second Amendment said shall not be infringed, and I try to give them a bit of information is as easy as possible that way it sinks in. I say you don't need a license and ask your government for permission to bear arms. It didn't say anything about that. You don't need to pay a tax. And they're like, hey, he's right. You know, so I drop a little bit of seed of knowledge and hopefully that resonates and goes somewhere eventually. So, um, but yeah, it's it's kind of interesting uh, what, what people think about the Second Amendment and what it really means, you know, so. That's wonderful. I really uh, appreciate you for you know letting me here in your house and just giving me a little piece of uh, you know your time. I know you're pretty busy. Is there anything else you want us to touch before we finish today? No, just uh, encourage people to get involved and do something. Uh, like I said, uh, you know I'm nobody special. Um, our our people here in Tarrant County, this group of people that we have. Uh, you know I don't mean to take it away from them, but we're nobody special. Anybody can do this. Um, you know, we can all be special together if we unite and uh, use each other's energies and and uh, just agree with what we can all agree on and move forward with that. So I think that's that's also pretty good because um, we are we can be stronger. You know, the more that we unite ourselves, because yeah. um, like the bad guys are pretty cohesive. Yeah. So we need to learn that from them and get like really together and get our act together and be able to. Uh, just create change, be the change we want to be. And there's more of us than there is them. That is true. <laughs> so thank you so much, man, and thank you guys. This is Luis with Emancipated Human with Corey Watkins. So um, if you want to learn more about him, uh, find him on Facebook. I'm going to put uh, his uh, link down below. Uh, also, uh, the Tarrant County Peaceful... Peaceful Streets. Streets. And um, your precinct chair. Yeah, precinct page. chair. So if you want to contact him, just do that. If you're in the dallas Fort Worth area, um, just find us uh, on Facebook. Um, he has his page there. We go and do walks often. Um, he, I mean, I don't go as often as he does, obviously, but uh, it's uh, pretty uh, educational and it feels really nice. And it's um, we're, we're doing a lot of work there. So with that, I appreciate you for watching. And if you have comments or feedback, put it on the comments. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Be well, peace, love, and anarchy.